in the darkest night. So this, this past week, we've been reflecting some on we were, uh, Isaiah 53. We were reading there last Sunday, and then in reflection, we were talking about Isaiah 53 at 45s in youth group. At a, at a morning Bible study with some senior hires. It was just prevalent and good to, good to reflect. Here this week, um, Pastor Jay has charged us, asked us to reflect. Then in Psalm 42. Uh, so I'll read that for you guys. Um, focus. There's a, there's a little chorus in the middle, verse 5 and verse 11, um, that, that say the same same things. Psalm 42, in Jesus' name. As a deer pants for flowing streams, so pants my soul for you, O God. My soul thirsts for God, for the living God. When shall I come and appear before God? My tears have been my food day and night. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? These things I remember as I pour out my soul. How I would go with the throng and lead them in procession to the house of God with glad shouts and songs of praise, a multitude-keeping festival. Why are you cast down, O my soul, and why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. My soul is cast down within me, therefore I remember you from the land of Jordan and of Hermon, from, the land, from Mount Mizar. Deep calls to deep at the roar of your waterfalls. All your breakers and your waves have gone over me. By, the day, by day the Lord commands his steadfast love, and at night his song is with me, a prayer to the God of my life. I say to God, my rock, why have you forgotten me? Why do I go mourning because of the oppression of the enemy? As with a deadly wound in my bones, my adversaries taunt me. While they say to me all the day long, where is your God? Why are you cast down, O my soul? And why are, you within, why are you in turmoil within me? Hope in God, for I shall again praise him, my salvation and my God. Yeah, hope in God. We got a really cool letter from the Bankstons, if you guys were here. Um, they're missionaries in Japan, and they were telling us... Um, told us a lot about what's going on there. It was just a really cool uh, Sunday to hear all that. But they sent us this letter. They said, Dear friends at Word of Life, we've enjoyed being with you last fall and continue to be grateful for your generous support each month. The musician we talked about with stage four cancer has had a miraculous recovery and will be in Ishinomaki next month for concerts. Thankful to be partnering with you, the Bangstons. So Dean and Linda sent this card. This is an awesome thing. Um, we got a hear this prayer request, this musician that um, yeah, is doing concerts around and with them, stage four cancer. Miraculous recovery. It's really cool. And so um, as we go before God now in prayer, um, we don't just go with just asks and requests, but um, we go with praise and thanksgiving uh, as well. Would you pray with me? God, uh, my hope, my salvation, our hope, our salvation, God. That's who you are, completely. I know that uh, I wrestle back and forth, and just like in the psalm, I ask, why are you cast down, O oh my soul? God, continue to be before my eyes. Um, remind me that you are my hope that you're, you are everything I need, God, and in you we find everything that we need in that salvation that you offer us. God, we want to praise you for the, the great things you do in this healing of this, of this musician in Japan, God, that he has an opportunity to go and spend more time with the banks and Zenin and hear and spread your gospel. We thank you for that. And God, we also know that um, we have sick and hurting people um, among us, here in this congregation, here in this community. And God, you do what's best for us. 
my body and my and and perfect hell aren't health aren't my hope having uh, all my friends and all my family around me aren't my hope. God, just, just you and eternity with you. God, that's my hope and the salvation you've offered. So do what you will, God. You be you because no one else can. And love us perfectly as, as you do. Lift up our downcast souls and help us remember you as our hope and our salvation, our God. Amen. I am alone in this dark sanctuary. They have all gone home. The lights have gone out. Just me and this empty room. dark. I can see the rafters. In the dark, I can see the stained glass drained of its color. This is not lonely. This is the breath before the song begins. I can feel it coming. The light comes through the windows, bright like the sunrise, but from all sides. The light illuminates the hues in the glass. The light illuminates the room. The light illuminates me. I am surrounded by God. I kept watch in the night. Others slept. I've waited for this. Now there's light. Now I am lifted. Now my soul soars in the rafters. God holds me up. God gives me wind. My soul is in the soaring place. There are still those who would hurt me. Throw rocks at my stained glass. Try to pull me down. Their words mean nothing. Their hate means nothing. I am soaring in the hands of the Creator. His light shines in me and out of me. This is my sanctuary. In this age, we, uh, we don't experience a lot of true darkness. When we lived in Iowa, I had the opportunity um, for a while to, to go on a school trip. Iowa is blessed with a whole bunch of caves. And, and every year, the, the school would take, what was it, fifth graders, sixth graders? Something like that. Fifth, sixth graders on a spelunking trip. I know, just saying the word is cool. Spelunking. That's cool. Uh, and, um, and, and they had this, um, they had this it, the bus just rumbles along and, and, and pulls into this, this gr long gravel drive to a picturesque farm in this beautiful green valley. And you think, what are we doing here? You don't see any cool rocks or anything like that. And, and you don't. You don't see anything. You just see this, this beautiful Iowa farm with the barn back there. And as you get a little closer, um, you can tell which of the school students um, don't live on a farm. Because they start to be like, what's that smell? And the students who do live on farms are like, what smell? And uh, as we hike a little bit further, uh, we come around the corner, and, uh, and, and there, there's a whole bunch of, uh, of cattle in this, in this pen, and we have permission from, from the farmer to, 
to walk alongside, right along this, this worn trail, right next to the cows. And it goes up and it walks its way through the pasture. There's a gate up at the top that's, uh, that's spring-loaded, undoubtedly because way too many students have left that gate un open, you know, and, and so it's now spring-loaded so that every time you come through, it goes, you know, you know, you go through it, and, and the students, it doesn't take them long to figure this out, you know, in, in the beginning, they're holding the gate open for each other and things like that, but no, 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 it doesn't take them long to figure out if I just leave a little extra space in this line, then he's not going to wait for me, and he leaves this spring open, and it comes back, and it goes, just like that, and makes this loud crack, and, and the cows all, you know, and they move and jump, and some student in the back of the line gets scared as the cows are. You keep hiking up over the top of this hill, and you, you come down, and, and, it's, and it's slippery. As it heads down this hill into, into just like this little hole, If you didn't know it was there, you'd pass right by it. Because there, down on the left, there's this, there's this uh, kind of rock face kind of thing. And then down at the bottom, way, way down, there's a very, very small hole. If you didn't know it was there, you totally walked past it. Everybody puts on these, these helmets and you have to get down literally on your belly and, and just to slide into, on the mud and stuff, into this hole. You have to wear clothes that you don't want to keep or something. Because <laughs> you, you just end up sliding around in mud and bat poo. You slide down this little incline, you know, it through this tiny little hole, there's always one kid who's like, nope, I'm not doing that. There's always one kid. And all the teachers and everybody are all encouraging them. There is usually one adult also who's like, I know I said that I would chaperone, but no, not doing that. At which point everybody kind of like guilts them into sliding into this hole Occasionally, one sits outside guarding the backpacks. Thanks. Thanks for guarding the backpacks. We appreciate that the squirrels won't come and raid them. You slide in, and, it, and it's down into this hole, and then you just kind of come into this very large cave. And there's all these kind of tiny little tunnels you know, and they all have really cool nicknames like Dragon's Tooth and Birth Canal. <laughs> oh, yeah. But before you can experience all of these tiny little crevices and, and channels, the guide has a couple of um, adults sit in front of this very small hole into the cave. And then she asks everyone to turn off their flashlights. There's always one kid who's last to turn his off and then turn it back on again and then turn it off. And it takes, it takes a few minutes to get everyone to turn their lights off, turn their mouths off, and experience the quiet of darkness. And that is the darkest darkness I've ever experienced in that cave. If everyone's quiet and doesn't wiggle around, you can't tell that you're surrounded by a whole bunch of fifth graders. It's, 
It's so dark you can't see your hand in front of your face. It is so dark that everything starts to feel weird. It's dark enough that you start to feel on your skin and you're like, oh, it's kind of wet in here. You can just feel the humidity. It's dark enough that your hearing just kind of wakes up and you can hear that person mouth breathing beside you and it gets loud and you're like, stop breathing until you think about it and you're like, oh, that's probably not healthy. <laughs> and they probably won't let me chaperone if I tell children to stop breathing. You, stop breathing. <laughs> But it does, it's just so dark. It's crazy, crazy dark. We don't experience that much because there's so much electricity in our world. There's so much light in our world. There's so much light in our experience that we don't experience that kind of darkness very often. But for a long, long time, that was something that the world experienced all the time. Light was precious. Light was valuable because darkness came every night. Now imagine yourself walking through that darkness. Walking through that darkness as you, as you head up hill and you climb up to Jerusalem. And as you climb up to Jerusalem, uh, what you thought was kind of just you and your friends becomes a, a crowd of people as the crowd of people just kind of snakes their way uphill because Jerusalem is, on, is a city on a hill. It is on the Lord's mountain. And, and as you snake your way up and you walk up into the darkness, I'm not sure which gate you're going through, but typically you're going to be approaching from the east and walking your way up through the east gate. That's the normal route that you would go as a, as a pilgrim, as a believer, as a worshiper. Walk your way through the darkness and start to see little glimmers of light in people's homes as they've lit lamps and things like that. There is no public lighting in the streets, though. You're walking in darkness. And as you walk towards the temple, the crowds become a little thicker. Because something, something special is about to happen. You work your way into the temple proper. In the temple, there are these, um, these large courts or large areas, some of them partially covered and some of them open to the air. And as you walk in and you make your way, you can see where you believe the court of women is. And there's a little tiny bit of reflection and glimmer in the court of women made by what you know is the largest candelabras you've ever seen. The, the priests have taken their old robes and used them as wicks They filled the vessels with oil and there they are in the middle of the darkness. The priests extend a torch and light the lamps in the middle of the dark night as a celebration in the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles to remind all of the worshipers what it was like to walk through the darkness of the, uh, of the wilderness and see the pillar of fire that God embodied that led them through the night. This reminds them of that as they see these giant torches in the sky and the whole city is illuminated by public light in the middle of the darkness, and it is special, and it is precious. They don't do this every night. Just at the celebration of illumination, in the middle of the Feast of Tabernacles, and the people come, and they worship, 
And as Jesus walked up, probably during that, that service of worship, he raises his voice, and it's recorded in John chapter 8, starting in verse 12. And I am reading in Jesus' name because these are his words. Again, Jesus spoke to them saying, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. His words are scandalous. Because those those lamps, that public light in the middle of the darkness is intended to remind them of the presence of Almighty God as he went before them in a pillar of fire. Verse 13, so the Pharisees said to him, you are bearing witness about yourself. Your testimony is not true. Jesus answered, even if I do bear witness about myself, my testimony is true. For I know where I came from and where I'm going. But you don't know where I came from or where I'm going. You judge according to the flesh. I judge no one. Yet even if I do judge, my judgment is true. For it is not I alone who judge, but I and the Father who sent me. In your law it is written that the testimony of two people is true. I am the one who bears witness about myself, and the Father who sent me bears witness about me. And they said to him, therefore, where is your father? Jesus answered, you know, neither me nor my father. If you knew me, you would know my father also. Here ends the reading of God's word. I, I have way more to share with you on this text than I could possibly do in one morning. There's so much about the Feast of Tabernacles. There's so much about the, the celebration of illumination. There is so much about um, the, the water celebration that happens during that exact same time and how it bears witness to who Jesus is. But let's focus on just one phrase. I am the light of the world. In a world that is so accustomed to darkness, so Jesus says, I am the light of the world. In the middle of a ceremony that illuminates the whole temple, and some said that it illuminated the entire city of Jerusalem for that one night. Jesus said, I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but have the light of life. Reflect. Spend a moment. Think about the darkest place that you've been. It's not just physical darkness. It's not just hanging out in a, in a cave with a bunch of fifth graders. It's those dark times of of the heart and of the mind. It's those dark moments of, of exhaustion, physical, spiritual, emotional. And in those darkest moments, Jesus speaks. I am the light of the world. Whoever follows me will not walk in darkness, but will have the light of life. I am the light of the world. And he is. He shines in the darkness. He helps you to see exactly what is going on in your darkest moments. I love Jesus and the way he does things. He's so unlike me. I 
I like to sometimes keep my very best stuff for myself. I do. Yesterday, I had some very special coffee that a friend gave me. I didn't bring that coffee to the office. I might have to share it with all of you, whoever stops by the office that day. But, you know, I, I, I took that, that coffee that I got from a friend, and, 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 I, and I ground it up special. And then I put it into, uh, I put it into my very special coffee brewing Chemex. And then I took my time with a very slow pour over as I just brewed that coffee drip by drip. I, I heated the temperature to of that water to exactly 205 degrees to make sure that I got precisely the kind of flavor that I was looking for out of that coffee. And I drank every single drop of it myself. There are people in my household who drink coffee. I didn't offer not even a cup of it to anyone. Because <laughs> I'm selfish. God's not like me. He shares his very best. So, so that one day he's saying, I am the light of the world. Follow me and you'll walk in the light of life. Another day he's saying, you are a light in the world. Matthew chapter 5. Verse 13, you are the salt of the earth, but the salt has lost its taste. How is it going to go? How can its saltiness be restored? It's no longer good for anything except to be thrown out and trampled under people's feet, potentially to melt some ice. You are the light of the world, a city set on a hill like Jerusalem during the illumination celebration. A city set on a hill cannot be hidden, nor do people light a lamp and put it under a basket, or, but they put it on a stand. We hang them from the ceiling. And it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before others so that they may see your good works and give glory to your Father who is in heaven. He doesn't just say, I am the light of the world. He says, you are the light of the world. Because Jesus isn't like me. He's not selfish. He gives his very best to his people. He says, follow me and you will walk in the light of life. He says, follow me and I will make you little lights. You're a light. That's what you do. If you're a believer in Jesus Christ, you are a light. And you just get to start walking out there and doing the good works which he's prepared in advance that you should walk in them. And as you do those things, then it all comes right back around and God gets all of the glory. As you do the good works that he's prepared for you to do, God gets all the glory. That's what it says. That's what Jesus says. So he starts off by saying, I am the light of the world, but he also says, you are the light of the world. I get it. We all go to a dark place. We all have to walk through some dark times. But no matter what darkness you're experiencing or have experienced in the past, Jesus is the light of life. He will shine in your darkness. But not just that. He makes you shiny too. He makes you the light of, uh, light of the world so that you can shine into other people's darkness so that they too can see the glory of God. As you reflect on, on Psalm 42, as you check out and, and, and reflect on, on John chapter 8, my prayer this week is that you will be honest with yourself about your darkness. What's your darkness? Is it sin that needs to come into the light? If so, there's some time for confession. What's your darkness? Is it spiritual? Do you have some spiritual turmoil happening right now? If so, we've got some people for you to talk to. Talk to me, talk to Eric, you know, talk to one of the elders. You saw a bunch of them serving communion today. What's your darkness? Is your darkness emotional? Emotional. 
You see, darkness, just a dark part in life. Jesus shines in that darkness because he is the light of the world. But he doesn't leave it there. He also makes you lights too. Do the good works that he's preparing for you to do. Do them. And give glory to God. Because he's the light. Let's pray. Lord, you know I got probably like three more sermons all backed into this one thing. And, um, and I'd love to keep the whole church for another couple of hours. God, you also know that um, the darkness is real. We feel the darkness. Um, of sad times and hard times. And Lord, I know that some people are going through some dark times even right now. But you shine your light into the darkness and you make things clear. That was one of the coolest things about being in that cave, God, was just one flashlight changed the entire cave. Change the entire experience for everyone in there. You are our light. You shine into our lives and make everything clear. You chase the darkness away and then you give your very best to us. You make us lights into this dark world. And you tell us not to hide it Not to stick it under a basket or tuck it away into a corner of our life where nobody's going to see it. You are our light. You're the light who shines through us. And we pray, Lord God, that you would move us to do the good works that you're, that you're preparing for us so that other people will see your light and believe, glorify you. We love you, Lord Jesus. It's in your name we pray. Amen. Receive this blessing. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look right at you and give you his peace. Amen? Amen. Amen. Go in peace and serve the Lord.